When you think about Brazilian composers, his name stands out as one of the all-time greats. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Eitor Villalobos. Villalobos was born in March 1887 in Rio de Janeiro, right towards the end of Brazil's colonial period. He was mostly self-taught and learned to play the guitar, the clarinet, and the cello, three instruments that to this day hold a special place in the music of traditional Brazilian ensembles. The little musical training he had was through his father, who would hold informal concerts and musical soirees at their home. But when Eitor was just 12, his father died suddenly of malaria, and all of a sudden he was thrust into the role as the family breadwinner. He fulfilled this by playing in theater orchestras throughout the then capital city. He failed the entrance exam of the local conservatory, and even though he made it on a subsequent try, did not last very long in the institution, and throughout the rest of his life would hold a certain disdain for the traditional practices of conservatories. When he was 18, he began thoroughly exploring traditional Brazilian music and culture, much to the chagrin of his mother, who wanted him to become a doctor. For much of the next decade, he would intentionally avoid traditional training, and instead go out into the wilderness to absorb the native sound. In his music, Villalobos set out to erase the line between the Brazilian music that he found and the European tradition, although he still used his multi-instrumentalist background to help make ends meet. He wasn't a professional composer quite yet. He continued his explorational period for about seven years, and while doing so, he learned the power of exaggeration. He would come back to the city with crazy stories, like being chased by cannibals through a rainforest. And while this probably didn't happen, he learned how to market himself. He knew what his brand should be, as if he was writing music from the furthest edge of civilization. Here we see the beginnings of a composer who really knew how to market himself, and who knew what he needed to do in order to stand out in the world. One of the more interesting things to know about Villalobos, and this is especially true of his early works, was that he composed at the guitar and not the piano, as many composers do, present company included. The reason this is interesting is because it affects the way guitarist composers write their voice leading. Because on the guitar, if you just make a shape with your hand and you move it up and down the fingerboard, you're going to have the exact same chord. You're going to have the same series of notes, it's just going to be transposed up or down, depending on how many frets you moved your hand up and down. Whereas on the piano, if you play a C major chord and have that same hand position, those same three white keys, the same distance from one another, and you move it up and down, you don't get other major chords. You get either a minor chord or a diminished chord, which means that composers who are really used to the way a piano works are going to write music that's different from the way a guitarist composer conceives of music in their style. Add on top of this that most guitarist composers write for their instrument exclusively or almost exclusively. Guitarist composers it can be a very insular world. A lot of even the most famous guitar composers aren't really well known outside of their world. Whereas Villalobos, or earlier on in history, Hector Berlioz, were composers who played the guitar primarily, and that affected the way that they wrote their music. On top of this, Villalobos was very attuned to the traditional ways that the Brazilian people and Brazilian culture used the guitar in their music, which made him a potent force when he tried to write for other instruments. It sounded so unique because, well, in part, he was coming from this guitarist background. Villalobos did write a lot of piano music, but he didn't seem to really take it seriously or really make it a significant part of his output until he met the pianist Arthur Rubinstein, who was one of the many musicians from Europe who were then touring Brazil. The European tradition just wouldn't quite let him go, but by the same token, he was responsible for introducing many European composers to the greatness of Brazilian music, thereby engaging in a fantastically productive cultural exchange. Of special importance was Darius Mior, a member of the Parisian group known as Les Cis. He brought in the works of great modernist Europeans hot off the press, while Villalobos exposed him to the best of the best of Brazilian music. And indeed, Mio would go on to write some of the most Brazilian-inspired music of any European. And Villalobos' first five symphonies would be written in the style 
of the French composer Vincent Dandy. Yet the Brazilian public wasn't always universally accepting of the kind of music that Villalobos was pioneering. Even at modern art performances or concerts given by elite performers, the public wasn't always so accepting. In fact, on many occasions, they'd boo and jeer. He got some warm receptions too, but the thing is his work wasn't universally enjoyed or accepted by the Brazilian public of his day. Paris, according to those who called the French capital home, was much more receptive to the kind of music that Villalobos wrote, and he found that out for himself. While he was in Paris, he not only enjoyed a warmer reception to his music, but he also added many more musical luminaries to his contact list. He would continue to split time between his native Brazil and his apartment in Paris, but he soon found himself in a bit of a pickle. Actually, a pretty big pickle. Because Brazil underwent a revolution in 1930, and a de facto military dictatorship began. Congress disbanded, and the Brazilian constitution was little more than a useless scrap of paper as President Getulio Vargas seized power. As a consequence of all this political turmoil, Villalobos was stuck in Brazil. He wasn't actually stuck per se, they weren't keeping him there by force. The thing is, he just couldn't exchange his currency for anything, so he couldn't leave and be able to pay for anything if he got anywhere else. Many of his pieces adopted an even more overt theme of Brazilian patriotism and nationalism, as his role as superintendent of musical and artistic education demanded. Due to his government job, he became hugely influential when it came to music educational practices in Brazil, and he was put in charge of music education in the entire country within two years. He was a hard worker and a natural fit for the role. He was able to continue to write music in addition to all of his duties, which included founding two conservatories. He had very little problem supporting his government no matter what they did. After all, he already wrote very nationalistic music, and his job was pretty safe because he was pretty widely liked. All the same, let's get one thing very clear. There is no evidence to support the idea that Villalobos harbored any sort of Nazi sympathy even though he worked for a government that, it can be pretty convincingly argued, was a little too Hitler cozy. After uprisings from both the far left and the far right, President Vargas officially became the dictator in 1937. Semantics, really. But his reign as dictator would be rather short, as his regime would be forced from power at the end of World War II. And with the end of the Vargas regime, Villalobos was free to travel around the world. Sadly, because of his 15-year confinement to his homeland, he was unable to visit his Parisian apartment or pay the bill, which meant that his stuff was unceremoniously evicted, and all the pieces he stored there were lost to time. Of his lost compositions, perhaps the most notable were the 13th and 14th entries, in his ongoing series entitled Shorus. While many of the pieces in this series are short, numbers 13 and 14 were going to be absolutely huge. Number 13 was apparently for two orchestras and band. Number 14 for multiple choruses, orchestra, and band. Although some Villalobos scholars doubt that these ever existed, or if they existed at all, existed in some kind of short score or draft form. It's highly unlikely that he had the time to write such massive pieces in their full form. But it really doesn't matter what position they were in because no matter what, it was the political strife and turmoil that kept them from ever being completed and performed. Villalobos never rewrote or reconstructed them from what he may have had. It was too much work. Besides, he had a lot of stuff on his plate, more stuff than he really knew what to do with. But he was determined to try to do it all. Despite poor health, a diagnosis of bladder cancer specifically, he threw himself into his work with a fury unmatched by perhaps anyone else. He exploded in a flurry of creative work, writing tons of new pieces, which is a full-time job, all while touring the world, conducting orchestras wherever they would have him. The Americas, all of the English-speaking world, really. He went to Japan, he went to Israel, he went everywhere. That's also another full-time job. How he did it all is beyond human comprehension to some extent. His time under the dictatorship had forced him to split time between his music educational efforts 
and his composition, and now he could focus full time on doing whatever he wanted. I don't know when he slept, to be perfectly honest with you. Eventually, he just couldn't go on any longer. He died in November 1959, at the age of 72, and his state funeral was one of the last to ever be held while Rio de Janeiro was still the capital, as Brasilia would open and serve as the new capital in April of the following year. Villalobos was a very confident man, whose musings on his own musicality can sometimes border on the self-indulgent. After a disastrous reception of one of his piano pieces early in his career, he told Rubinstein that I'm still too good for them, the them being the public. Towards the very end of his life, he stirred up controversy by saying that Brazil was dominated by mediocrity. He told Europeans that he didn't use the folklore, he was the folklore, and that when he came over there, he didn't come to learn as many other New World composers did. He came there just to show off what he had already completed. He said that his first harmony teacher was a map of Brazil, and that music flowed out of him as naturally as water flows from a waterfall. This was all part of his self-promotion. This was all part of his brand. My brand! This was all part of him trying to establish himself as not just a Brazilian composer, but THE Brazilian composer. And it worked. One should always be careful not to take his quotes out of context, otherwise you risk painting him as some kind of self-absorbed braggart. He especially loved the cello. It was one of his instruments, so he knew the ins and outs of writing for it idiomatically, and arguably his most famous piece, the Bacchianus Brasileiras No. 5, is scored for soprano and cello ensemble. The first in his series of Bacchianus Brasileiras is scored for cello orchestra, the same thing except without the soprano. The series of Bacchianus Brasileiras as a whole translates to Brazilian Bach-like pieces and attempts to fuse sort of Baroque idioms and styles with traditional Brazilian music. He also wrote two cello concerti and a fantasia for cello and orchestra, which is all the more surprising when you consider that the cello is not usually the first instrument that composers pick if they want to write a concerto. It's very easy to overpower the cello with the size of the orchestra. You have to be very careful with how you handle the orchestra so you're not just having the cellist saw away and you can't even hear what they're playing. He was just astoundingly prolific. He wrote nine operas, 17 string quartets, 12 symphonies, and tons of pieces for piano solo and for guitar solo. His guitar etudes in particular are highly regarded because they're not just technical exercises. They're just as nice to listen to as they are to play, whereas a vast amount of the etude as a genre just sounds like technical exercises. He was to the guitar etude as Chopin had been for the piano etude. He made them into concert pieces as much as technical exercises that helped the guitarist advance in their technique. His output is hard to measure because of its sheer vastness and the fact that many pieces are lost but he easily wrote around a thousand pieces, and at least one estimate I found pegged the number at around 3,500, which I find a little hard to swallow. Perhaps that number is inflated if you count, you know, individual movements or arrangements of other pieces, but still, the fact is he wrote a ton of music. Because of his sheer productivity, some of his pieces are considered flops or duds, or just not as good as some of the other, better pieces in his output. This is especially true when you get later and later in his career. When he knew his days on this earth were numbered, he tried to write all of the pieces, and this meant that sometimes his pieces weren't quite as good. He still had some great pieces later on, don't get me wrong, but pieces like the Guitar Concerto. I mean, you're not going to find very many guitarists who really, really like that piece or like playing it. And his fifth and final Piano Concerto didn't really get glowing reviews when it was premiered. While his proclivity for productivity did not hurt him when he had the time and the energy to really make sure every piece was good, it was clear that towards the end, it was starting to bite him in the rear end. The Bacchianus Brasileiras and the Chorus are especially interesting because entries in those respective series rarely have the same instrumentation. In fact, sometimes it's hard to hear links between entries in those series Aside from the fact that entries in the Bacchianus Brasileira series have a tendency towards neoclassicism, whereas entries in the Chorus have a tendency towards emulating the Brazilian style of music of the same name. 
Taken together, Villalobos' output is one of the most fascinating fusions of disparate styles in the history of music. His mastery of all styles and instrumentations, from South America to Europe and beyond, make him, in many minds, the greatest Brazilian composer who ever lived.